Okay, so I, I think everybody's there, so I'm going to start. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Bartosz Golaszewski. I'm originally from Poland, but uh, I've been living in France for the almost, almost six years now. And uh, yeah, this is my first time at Kernel Recipe, so I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I'm employed by uh, Baylibre. We are a uh, Linux, embedded Linux consultancy. Uh, we're based in Nice on the southern coast of France. And we're currently at around uh, 40 engineers. Uh, we, we work on all kinds of uh, projects in the embedded Linux field. So we assist our clients in, uh, in, in, in developing consumer electronics products from hardware design uh, through software development uh, to, to the launch and, and uh, updates. We do upstream kernel development and maintenance, uh, and we are the founding developers of the kernel CI project. And my talk today is going to be about uh, probably a, a, a relatively trivial uh, subsystem in, in, in the Linux kernel, that is uh, GPIO, uh, and specifically about uh, using GPIOs from, uh, from the user space. So I, I suspect that uh, a lot of you in this room will have a notion of, of what GPIOs are and uh, how they work, but just for the sake of uh, completeness of the talk, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a brief introduction. So GPIO stands for uh, general, in, general Purpose Input Output, uh, and it's basically a, a pin that you can uh, program, uh, and it can, have it, it can have two values, so it can be uh, either high or low, uh, or uh, if you will, uh, it, it, its value can be one or zero. It can be programmed to be in uh, two modes, so either it's in input mode, which means that you, someone else is driving the pin and you just uh, read its value, or it can be in output mode, where you are the one who is driving the pin and someone else uh, uses it, uh, reads it, its value. And uh, then a GPIO pin in input mode can serve as a source of interrupt. So some events can happen, like the value can change, and then you can have a hardware interrupt uh, to, to, uh, to know that, that this uh, event happened. And uh, despite the relative simplicity of, of this idea, uh, there are, there are there is quite a significant number of uh, applications for it. So uh, you can use the GPIOs to uh, to get uh, to, to to read events from from buttons, GPIO buttons. You can uh, drive LEDs. You can control all kinds of devices of simple devices that only need this to to, to know this uh, high or low state. So uh, buzzers and uh, different uh, power switches and relays, uh, motors, different various motors in, in robotics like simple level sensors uh, and, and other devices like thermostats or pumps. And uh, the idea is that the SOC, like usually you, you need a, a, someone who will provide you with GPIO pins. So in that case, it's usually either the SOC itself or if you need more uh, GPIO pins because uh, an SOC typically provides you with, uh, with a couple of GPIO pins. If you need more, you use external uh, components, uh, which we call GPIO expanders that are connected to the SOC via I2C or SPI. And uh, currently in the kernel, we have uh, uh, two coexisting interfaces. They both follow uh, a provider consumer model. And one of them is the legacy system. It's uh, based on, uh, uh, on GPIO numbers. Uh, so you have a global GPIO number space, and you need to know the exact number. And uh, because it's it's quite uh, inconvenient to use it, it's it's been uh, long deprecated, and, and you shouldn't use it. Uh, and instead, there is a recommended framework uh, based on GPIO descriptors. Uh, the difference is that the prefix for all the all the symbols is GPIO D instead of GPIO. And uh, this framework gives you much more fine-grained control over the pins, and you can also uh, uh, you can also easily associate resources, which in this case are GPIO lines with uh, with users, with consumers, uh, either by specifying the like associating the users and uh, and the providers uh, in device tree or ACPI tables or by specifying uh, GPIO lookups uh, in, uh, in, in machine code. So yeah, they, uh, the, 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 the descriptor-based framework supports uh, device resource management for, uh, for driver code, and also um, 
and, and then the GPIO, GPIO provider uh, drivers live in uh, drivers slash GPIO in the Linux kernel source. And the consumers are pretty much all over the place because uh, many, many drivers will make some use of GPIOs uh, not necessarily uh, connected to their primary function um, as, a, as, a, as a sort of supporting function. Uh, so this is what happens in the kernel. And then there, is, uh, there are GPIOs in the user space. So the general idea, and this is also stressed by, uh, by, the, Linux by the GPIO subsystem maintainer, Linux Valage, that uh, you should not be using GPIOs from user space. But it's, uh, in th this is in the ideal world. And in the real world, uh, there's quite a significant number of users which will want to, u to, to interact with GPIOs from user space. Sometimes it's because there is no, uh, there is no proper uh, Linux framework for that. This is in case of power switches and relays. And uh, then some devices will, are, are simply uh, controlled from user space, like for instance, GPS uh, devices are usually, uh, like the, the, the software for them is usually written in, in user space and then communicates with the GPS, the GPS device over serial port. And sometimes uh, there, there, are, there are additional GPIOs that you want to toggle. Um, and certain users simply prefer to use uh, GPIOs from user space instead of um, writing kernel drivers. I, I noticed that a lot of people involved with uh, intelligent home systems uh, and uh, programming robots will want to write their software in, in user space and then uh, they, they will want to have some, some interaction with the hardware but uh, without wasting time on, on writing kernel modules. So uh, up to this point, the, the standard way of, uh, up to recently, uh, the standard way of interacting with GPIOs was the uh, Sys class GPIO interface, the SysFS interface. Like how many of you uh, have used or, or still use the, this, this uh, some, okay, so there are, there are some. So this, uh, this uh, interface, uh, the patch that introduced it, was merged uh, during the time when the GPIO subsystem in the kernel did not have uh, an, an active maintainership. Um, so this, this somehow got uh, through, although it, it had the certain shortcomings from the beginning. So because it's a SysFS interface, it's, uh, it's global. It's a global state, uh, and it's not tied to any process. So you can, uh, you can have multiple processes with enough permissions accessing the, 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 the GPIO attributes. Uh, and if, for instance, you have some process which comes and, and uh, changes uh, certain properties, uh, certain, certain values, uh, I don't know, exports uh, GPIOs and then dies and crashes, uh, the state uh, remains as, as, as it last was. The, not, not, nothing comes back to, to default. Uh, and the uh, API, the, the CFS interface, was not uh, very uh, convenient to use. So you have, for every line, you have a directory, uh, you have uh, certain attributes, uh, you have to write to, to, to different files, uh, read them, compare strings. Sorry. Uh, and you also re have to rely on the global GPIO number space. So basically, uh, the same thing that I mentioned when talking about the legacy in-kernel uh, framework, you have a global uh, continuous GPIO number space and you need to know these numbers because um, in, in practice, the SysFS uh, interface is a user of the legacy API. So it, it, it basically, it, like in the kernel, it's, it's, it's a user of the legacy uh, API up to this point. So you need to know the numbers, the specific numbers, and also you need to, uh, they, they can change because if you have a, a, a dyna dynamically loaded module, uh, for, for a GPIO expander, and depending on the, on the order uh, in which these modules will be loaded, the numbers can change. Uh, so, uh, and this is also like a flattened representation of a two-level um, hierarchy, which is, uh, yeah, not, not very convenient as well. And then there is the polling for events, for line events, for interrupts. Uh, this is possible with SysFS, but it's uh, quite complicated and unreliable, because uh, you can poll uh, the value attributes for events, but then when the poll function actually returns an event, you need to either reopen the value uh, file descriptor or, uh, or else seek it to the beginning and then read the value for, to, to know if it was a rising edge or a falling edge event. And these events were not queued because they were not really read as an event from, from, from a file, but uh, rather you, you, you would just reread the value. It, uh, there was no buffering, so events could get uh, lost. 
So uh, as a remedy for that, uh, in Linux 4.8, uh, we merged a new, um, a new user interface, which is a uh, character device. So in this new interface, each GPIO chip uh, exports, um, say, the, 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 the GPIO subsystem exports for each GPIO chip a separate GPIO chip device. They are called GPIO chip 0, 1, and so forth. Uh, and since it's a regular character device, you can uh, use standard kernel, uh, st standard system calls to interact with it. So you can open it, you can call ioctl uh, on the defined descriptor, you can pull the descriptor, you can read, in this case you can read events, and you can close it. Uh, and uh, there, are, yeah, there are many advantages of, of this new uh, API. So for instance, you can now uh, request multiple lines at once, uh, you can read values and set values of multiple lines at once. Uh, you can look up GPIO lines and chips by uh, names in case of lines and by names and labels in case of uh, GPIO chips. You can affect uh, now from user space the way the kernel drives uh, GPIO lines uh, by specifying new flags um, like open source and open drain. These are, I, I don't want to get into details, but these affect how the kernel uh, drives uh, GPIO lines. And now you also uh, receive view events from, uh, from the kernel. You can use UDEV to change permissions and, uh, on all of the devices and uh, yeah, uh, manage it. Uh, and now we have reliable polling. So now that the events are actually buffered in the kernel, you can read all the events, even if you don't read them right away, they're not gonna get lost, they're gonna, gonna be buffered and you can read them later. And uh, the user API lives in, uh, in the kernel headers. It's in Linux GPIO.h. Um, the, the file is logically split into uh, several parts. So you have um, operations to, for, for getting the information about the chip. Uh, about lines, then you can request lines for uh, reading values and, and setting them. You can execute the line uh, get and line, line value set, line value get uh, operations. Then you can, again, request uh, lines. Unfortunately, it's impossible to request multiple lines for uh, event monitoring, but yeah, you can, you can request a, a single at a time. You can poll for events and, and, and uh, read them. And I actually have some examples of the code, but uh, yeah, due to the time constraints, I, I, I think I'm either gonna leave them for later or, or simply omit them because, uh, yeah, it, 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 it would take some time. So instead, so actually, you probably won't be using this, uh, this low level uh, kernel new API a lot because there is, uh, there is a new project. Well, it's, it's no longer very new, but uh, it exists. Uh, it's called libgpiod, and this is a uh, project that contains a C library and a set of tools that uh, should make it easy for users to interact with this character device. Uh, so a bit of history behind it. Uh, at Paylibre, we have these uh, Acme power measurement capes for uh, Beaglemore and Black. Uh, and at some point, we, uh, we looked for a reliable way, for, for a proper way to uh, toggle uh, the power switches on, on, on uh, on, on these probes that we use for power measurements. And since uh, the monitors itself, uh, themselves on, on, on these probes were driven by uh, IIO drivers, I, I thought about using IIO attributes for that, uh, but it turned out that uh, since these GPIOs are completely separate from, from the monitors itself, themselves, uh, the maintainers didn't like the idea of adding uh, an, an IIO attribute for, uh, for controlling uh, something that is basically a power switch external to the IO device. Then I thought that maybe I could uh, introduce uh, regulators that are controlled from user space, but uh, the, the regulator subsystem maintainer uh, <laughs> told me pretty, pretty quickly that it's not the best idea and it's been tried 10 times before and uh, he always says no. Uh, and eventually I uh, start, uh, started playing with this GPIO character device. So uh, immediately I noticed that uh, it's not very convenient because it's still, you, you need to write C code in order to, to play with it. So instead of uh, writing you know, small C programs uh, for, for, for this kind of, uh, uh, for this kind of uh, programs, I, 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 I thought about writing something that will make it simpler. 
So first, uh, a, a higher level C library and then a set of command line tools uh, that, that, that would uh, basically replace uh, the need for, uh, for working with SysFS because um, the, the main concern of, of many people who, who first learned about this character device is that uh, they would no longer be able to use uh, their, their scripts, uh, their, their shell scripts that, uh, that played with SysFS attributes and instead would have to rely on C programs. So yeah, libgpiod uh, fixes this issue by introducing a set of command line tools. Uh, and the first version was released in January 2017. Uh, this was the 0.1 version. Uh, this one was pretty simple, uh, but it grew over time. Uh, two more unstable releases uh, were made during 2017, and then in uh, 2018, uh, in February, we released the uh, 1.0 version. This is the one with, with a stable API. Uh, and yeah, the current stable version is 1.1.1. 1 .1 .1. uh, 1 1.2 is coming soon. I'm going to talk about it uh, in a moment. And since some distros uh, already managed to package the 0.x uh, series, I'm still supporting the 0.3 version with, uh, with bug fixes. Uh, so what's inside? As I said, we have a um, library, a C library, a higher level library, with, um, with API fully documented in Oxygen. We have a set of command line tools. These were kind of uh, inspired by I squared C tools, so the names may sound, may sound uh, familiar. And then we have a uh, custom test suite. So basically, I, I wanted to make something that would allow, uh, that will allow us to test both libgpid, the project, and the kernel API. So I came up with this idea where uh, we could use the GPIO mockup driver. This is a testing driver uh, that, that exports dummy, dummy GPIO, li GPIO lines. And I wrote this test suite which basically uses libkmod to load this module with uh, specified attributes. And then uses libudev to detect new devices that would come up. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the interrupt simulators is something uh, I, I wrote from the, for the kernel which basically allows to, to simulate uh, interrupts, uh, which, which is nice to, to test uh, the, the, the API that allows to read line events. Uh, so there's that, and then we now have object-oriented bindings for C++ and Python 3. So the API is uh, split logically uh, similarly to, uh, to the kernel U API. So there are chip operations, uh, like getting chip information and, and uh, information about lines. There are line operations, so you can, again, request information about uh, separate lines. You can request them, uh, set their values, get their values, read events. And there's uh, two more things that are not present in the kernel U API. So there's iterators, so you can easily iterate over uh, all the chips and uh, lines. And there is something that I call, uh, I, I refer to it as simple API, but it's probably uh, uh, better if, if it's named uh, contextless API because, and this is how it's uh, also called in the code, which is basically a set of functions that allows you to, uh, to, to, to perform certain simple uh, actions with GPIOs without caring about resources. So basically just functions without any, any data structures. Uh, so this is just, I, um, I hope you can see it. So this is just an example of the, of the C API. Uh, so yeah, this is quite uh, simple. You open the chip, you can open it in many different ways. There are, there are several helper functions. Then you can get the line, which in this case we do, we, we, we get the line at offset three, uh, and, and, and we get a pointer to an opaque struct. Uh, then you can request it. So in this case, we are requesting a line in input mode, so we're gonna be reading the value. We specify the consumer string. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention about this when, when I was talking about the character device. So previously, uh, a GPIO line has, if, if it's exported in the kernel, it has a consumer. And uh, when you export it from user space using the sysfs uh, interface, it's always called sysfs. But uh, with uh, libgpiud, you can actually specify the consumer string so you can uh, notify other users who's using this line when it's, when it's exported. So in this case, we're, uh, we're specifying the consumer. Then we actually read the value. This is when we, when, we, uh, when we actually retrieve the value. And then we close the chip. And when we close the chip, uh, all resources associated with this chip are, are freed as well, so all the lines. 
So this is, a, uh, this is a, another example I want to show how, how we're reading line events. So again, we, we open the chip. Uh, I hope you can see it. We open the chip, we get the line at offset three, and now we request it for uh, rising edge events. Again, we specify the consumer string. And then in a loop, what we do is basically we, we uh, run the, we, we, we wait for an event to occur on this line. Uh, then we read it. Uh, the, the, the information about this event uh, gets uh, written to this uh, event, uh, GPIOD line event bu buffer, and then, yeah, we, we, we just print it. Uh, you can do it this way, or if you want to uh, use your, your, own, uh, you, your own event loop, like clip event or, or uh, the, the event loop from, from glib, you can use it, you can retrieve the, the very underlying file descriptors. Uh, so this is the, the CAPI, I, I won't get much uh, into detail about it, but uh, the, something that interests a lot of people is, uh, are, are the tools that come with the library. Um, so yeah, the tools will allow you to replace your uh, scripts that, uh, that use the SysFS interface. Uh, there are six of them, so first one is GPIO detect. This one allows you to, uh, well, detect GPIO chips. It prints the GPIO chip name, its label, and uh, like the, 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 the second column, and then the number of lines. And once you, you know which one you want to uh, learn more about, you can use GPIO info. You can specify uh, multiple chip names or, or even no chip name, then it will print the information for, for all chips. And it will just list all the lines for a given chip and tell you what is the name of the line, if it's used, in what mode it is, if it's set to active high, active low. Active high and active low, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attribute of, uh, of GPIO lines where uh, you know if the pin is active when it's driven high or low, or, the, 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 of, or, or, or this, if this logic is inverted. This, this is a minor detail. So then you can, as I, as I said before, you can look up GPIO lines by, by their name. For that, you can use the GPIO find tool uh, in this case, we're, uh, we're trying to find the line that is called GPIO mockup B3. Uh, and what it returns is the name of the chip and, uh, and the offset of this line. And we can actually use this output, as it's shown below, to when, when, when uh, using the GPIO get and GPIO set functions. Uh, in this case, yeah, we're using this output to, uh, to, get the, to read the value of a line. Yeah, in this case, it's zero. Uh, and then what we do next, so um, we use the GPIO set uh, tool to set the value of, uh, of line 3 to 1. Uh, and we read again, in this case we, we read 5 lines from offset 1 to 5 and, and we can see that the, th the, the line offset 3 uh, is changed to 1. And the next example, this one, so uh, some lines can be actually driven by hardware by default or can be, uh, like, in, in, instead of being uh, floating, uh, like, if, if, they are, if, they are, if they are connected, like, if, if they are connected to a resistor or something, they, they are driven in a certain way. Uh, when you, because the character device uh, descriptors are tied to processes, once the process exits, uh, the, the state of this chip goes to default, goes back to default. So you may want to keep your process alive uh, so that the line is still exported and it's actively driven. Uh, in this case, you can specify the mode to GPIO set. Uh, in this example, the mode is wait, which means that it will, the program will wait for uh, user input. Uh, you can specify multiple modes like timeout, uh, in where, uh, where, the, where GPIO set will wait a certain amount of seconds. Uh, you can specify the mode called signal, which will wait for user signals, uh, etc. And uh, the next tool is for monitoring, the last tool is for monitoring uh, lines for GPIO events. Uh, it's called GPIO Mon. So in, in this example, we monitor the GPIO chip zero on line uh, two. Uh, if no um, additional parameters are specified, we're monitoring, uh, we're waiting for both, both, both edge events, so rising edge and, and falling edge. Uh, and by default, this tool prints uh, a human readable string describing the event. But if you want to use it in a script, you can specify uh, a format that is uh, less human readable and uh, more suited for usage in, in scripts for, uh, for machine parsing. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it for the tools. So in version 1.1, uh, 
uh, we added uh, some additional high level uh, some, some bindings for uh, high level languages uh, so there is uh, there's a set of object uh, of, of classes of C++ classes uh, where the, the entire C API is, is, uh, is wrapped in a, in a C++ interface, uh, which makes coding uh, a lot easier uh, because you, have, uh, you, can, you can use um, shared pointers and, and, and whatnot, like the features of, of uh, modern C++. This API is, is uh, fully documented in Doxygen as well. The code is exception, exception safe. Uh, I re-implemented some, some uh, like most of the tools in C++ uh, as an example of how to use this API. Uh, and also many examples are included in the in the repository. So this is just an example. I don't know if you, if you like me, actually enjoy uh, programming in C++ because I, I, I think I may be one of the few kernel developers who, who likes C++. Uh, this is just to show you that uh, reading a value or setting a value in, in this case, it's much easier. So uh, you, you actually open the chip with the constructor, you get the lines, you can actually have, whoops. You can actually have them in a, in a vector, uh, which is easier if, like, the, the example I, I showed before was only dealing with a single line, but when you need to fill your array with uh, offsets and, and do, all, do all that, it it's actually gets, uh, the code gets, gets much longer. So in this case, you can, you can use the advantages of C++. Uh, you specify the direction to output and you set five lines at once at different um, offsets corresponding with, I'm sorry, four lines at once with offsets corresponding with the uh, with the vector pass to get lines. Uh, and this is an example of how to read events in C++. So again, we open it, we get the line, we open the chip, we get the lines, uh, we request it for both edges and uh, we wait. Uh, and when the lines event wait method returns, we, we have a collection of lines in, in the events variable, uh, which we can then print. Uh, and something that a lot of users uh, asked about right from the start, and uh, many, many people actually created, uh, generated some, some uh, automatically generated Python, Python bindings for this library. Because apparently Python is used a lot in robotics and, uh, and home automation, and people who, who wanted to use this library uh, really cared about Python. So I decided to write a uh, Python 3 native module, uh, which was fun. Uh, in this case, we again have all the, all the C API wrapped in a set of Python classes, uh, fully documented in PyDoc, so you can uh, use help uh, from, inside, from within the Python interpreter to uh, look up uh, how, how the classes work, the, the, the documentation. Uh, as I said, it's, it's written in C, so it works as, a, as a, an extension module with uh, C Python. Uh, and again, yeah, tools are re-implemented and uh, many examples are included. Uh, just two examples of how to use it in, in Python. So, uh, unfortunately, unlike C++, when uh, we're uh, destroying of objects is uh, uh, deterministic in, in, in Python, we, we can't count on that. So, we have to use the with statement, which will close the chip while, while not, when, when, when you longer use it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's very similar to, uh, to what we did in C++. So, we get the lines, we request them, uh, we set the lines, that's it. And uh, the same goes for reading uh, the events. So we, we wait for the events. Uh, and if an, an event occurred, then we will have uh, a collection of lines. And then we can just simply read the event from each line on which an event occurred and print it. That's it. So another thing that is coming soon is uh, something that uh, people ask me about is uh, Dbus, uh, a Dbus daemon for, uh, for controlling GPIOs. Um, so, I actually started working on it. It's available on, on my GitHub. Uh, it will be a daemon written in C and uh, based on GDBus and uh, GUDIF libraries. Uh, as objects, it will export chips and uh, lines exported by, by, uh, exp exposed by those chips, so it will be still a two-level hierarchy. Uh, certain, uh, certain things will be exported as properties, like names, labels, offsets. Uh, and certain uh, operations will be uh, provided as methods. And I think about uh, providing line events, reading line events as, as Dbus signals. Uh, and yeah, for the future. So I think that after, uh, after, D after implementing Dbus bindings, the, the, the library will be pretty much feature complete. 
uh, from things that I, I want to add in the future are uh, proper tests for Python and C++ bindings, so like a proper test suite using, uh, provide, using standard libraries and instead of just implementing something by hand. Uh, maybe a feature when uh, we could run some external processes from GPIO monitor uh, on when, when events uh, occur. Uh, and yeah, I plan because I, uh, there, is, there, there is plans, there are draft plans for introducing some new features to the kernel, uh, to, the, to the user's uh, user API the, the, from the, for, the, for the kernel uh, UAPI. And I think I, I definitely will support them once they're out in the library. Uh, and so, where to get it? Uh, the project is hosted on kernel.org. Uh, releases are uh, available as tarballs. Um, I, uh, I actually support it in MetaOpen Embedded and BuildRoot, so the, the recipes are updated whenever there's a new release. And uh, distri several distributions have already packaged this uh, project, unfortunately mostly in, in its uh, 0.3 version. I know about Fedora, Arch, Debian, I think Gentoo also has it. Uh, and yeah, so uh, contributions and bug reports are welcome. Uh, please send them to Linux GPIO mailing list uh, and add a libgpiod prefix. And uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, are there questions? No questions. Uh, there's a question over there. Can we have the mic? Yeah. Is it turned on? Price file format to monitor uh, GPO events, like you can open it later in Wireshark or similar things to, does this exist? Not that I know about. Okay. So uh, what's the overhead of the library compared to poking the API directly? Uh, there is not much overhead because you don't do any allocations you, like, outside of uh, requesting the lines or opening the chip. Uh, so basically it's just a thin C layer. Like as long as you're using the C library, there's only a thin uh, C layer on top of the, of the IOCTLs and, and uh, other system calls. Thanks. There's a question in the back. So one of the issues we see in, in uh, people using uh, GPIO interfaces, either they poke SysFS, which is fine because there was no alternative, um, or they poke uh, registers directly, so they just map hardware into user yeah, space and poke that, <laughs> um, which is even worse. Yeah. Uh, now, they obviously do that for two reasons. One is because uh, maybe SysFS isn't available or it's just really hard to use for them, and that definitely mitigates a few of those issues. Um, but it does not help with the performance part, at least I mean, this shouldn't be much faster than a SysFS-based interface was. So, and if they already were driven to uh, pull registers directly in a SysFS-based world, they still won't adopt an actual abstract interface even with this. Um, so, are you planning to give them some path to actually get their constraints settled? I mean, something like, I don't know, a BPF event-based framework in the kernel, whatever it is. I mean, any, anything that basically allows them to run fast. Well, it's, it's already faster than SysFS. Uh, there were even, actually someone posted uh, measurements uh, some time ago, and actually all the string comparison in, in SysFS uh, caused the, the, the previous system to run much slower. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, I, I don't have any plans for that, so um, I'm focused on this one. This is enough for my needs. Um, I, I, guess, I guess they should probably write a kernel module if, if, they, want to <laughs> if they want to do it fast. I, I don't think you will find uh, people that just randomly poke 485 megahertz chips uh, writing kernel drivers for that. Yeah. They, they want to, they, the, the whole value add of their user space is that it's, I mean, that's, that is their whole software, right? Mm. All right? Okay. All right. Wait, Marek, I, I wanted to give you the microphone. If you're speaking anyways. Should 
GPI, yeah, the other benefit of the GPIO chip interface is that you can operate multiple lines at the same time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think I mentioned it. Uh... Yeah, with the SysFS interface, you oh, cannot do it. And if you do operate multiple lines at the same time, it allows at least some sort of synchronicity. Yeah. Like when you have them on the same GPIO chip, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there a question in the back? No? no? Okay, so I, uh, I think that's it.